Okay, recording started. Welcome everybody to the the 5th of July, right after the 4th of July meeting, OSC development team. We're going to dive right in. There's a lot of progress to cover, so what, what I'll do is, as normal, go through the agenda. Uh, please look at the, the working document. And here it is. Okay, so we're moving right along. Uh, the development numbers here actually interestingly last week we had a peak so if we look at the we actually reached a little micro peak in terms of development team hours so we always track our number of people who are contributing actually logging in the work logs and the total number of hours divided by 10 so last week we actually had about 160 development hours I was a little over that essentially four full-time equivalent that's great little micro peak but we, we're still kind of at a plateau here as we refine our methods there's a big recruiting spree with a lot of people from Saudi Arabia that are actually gonna join a team so so there's that in progress should have a, uh, a spike in developer population as we start another team the tractor team actually we're gonna get into that um, but of course the goal here is the 160 hours is essentially for full-time equivalent well uh, but at the full glory of the project we'd like to build up to about a hundred times that so 400 uh, full-time developers by comparison Linux has 4,000 full-time developers uh, or contributors who are supporting the Linux kernel development project so that's, that's the kind of scale we're talking about and right now we're at our very baby stages of where we are with open source ecology. So this is, uh, but definitely on a, on a path and we want to see this, this growing here. So let's talk first about progress of what's happened over the last week right here on the home base here. We did a lot of work. We had Shane Oberloyer from Michigan Tech University visit us for two weeks and we built a CNC circuit mill, uh, which you see here. We were working on the main the main project that we were actually working on is a power open source power meter for the seed eco home what you see here is the second story of the seed eco home uh, we're currently working on it uh, there's the power panel running from the photovoltaics and we've got all these different nodes like you see here connecting to measure all the different power points from what are we getting from the battery from the photovoltaics how much is passed through the charge controller, through the batteries, through AC loads, DC loads. It's a 100% off-grid system. We are not tied to the grid there. So we want to know exactly what we, what we are using. And here we have a sample measuring nodes here. It's a logging system, so an Arduino logging system that measures power. What we did here was we actually took our nuts, <laughs> the big one-inch nuts, the same as we use in, tra in the tractor, we use them as a current transformer. We wrapped a bunch of wire around that. So if you uh, slip a wire into that nut, uh, you're going to be measuring the current, the AC current, uh, because there's a an electric field that gets set up, and the uh, and the coils pick it up to to get a voltage. So you can actually be measuring current with this. So these are this is the open source board that was. Um, milled partly on um, Shane's mill and here we've got work on a uh, circuit mill here so to return to that it's actually quite exciting so the first run like look at this right here those are half a millimeter wide that, that little distance in between the two lines is one half millimeter that's pretty good for a first try what we did here was use the D3D CNC circuit mill with a spindle so the same construction as the 3D printer um, so showing that we can use use the the universal axis for different purposes so we have a, a board and a spindle that's milling with this tiny drill bit or mill bit and we put the XY gantry pretty low so we have the optimal distance so it's, it's really stiff the, the structure here is quite nice there's two two Y axes two X axes and two Z axes very very stiff like when you move, try to move the bottom here it's it's nice and tight so we can get this kind of work but it's try one and we're we're moving forward on it here what you sh you see here is we're actually probing the surface so when you're milling you're milling only 0.1 millimeter deep that is tiny so to get that you have to get the board perfectly level what, what that how you do that is by probing the surface of your little little circuit board and 
you probe it by making an electrical connection between so you see here are two leads one is to the the milled board itself and one to the actual bit the milling bit so that upon hitting the surface you're probing you're probing the bed at multiple points to get a height map and the way you detect that it touched is when electrical contact is made so hence those two leads there that's what we did so check this out so this is um, initial try with broken bits so it turned out the bit was broken so we got that then, then we um, it's very easy to break the little bits so so we did this and then we we uh, got this result here and then went even better on try two and that was done by lowering the gantry um, meaning uh, instead of uh, basically making that distance from the bit to where it's held on the XY axis the smallest uh, what we did was we lowered the XY gantry so that we're milling uh, with as much stiffness as possible if you if you know what I mean here so that's pretty good and we're refining so that's that's the stage we're refining right now so let's t take a look at progress on a 13 inch D3D 3D printer itself so I've been printing a lot of parts these days uh, there's a bunch of time lapses if you go into the view mode present mode you can see this video of some parts being built so next is building more so this is in production so uh, I made nine more uh, frames these are 13 inch cluster for uh, 3d printing so here's some steps in the process all the 3d printed parts putting the bearings putting in a bunch of screws together and so forth so that's moving along the idea is uh, our goal for the next workshop is to is to build 24 printers that means a lot of printing of parts it takes about a full day to print one set of parts like 24 hours so it's really like one or two days so thinking about 24 printers we would need 24 24 days of printing non-stop with a single printer or if you have multiple printers you divide that accordingly so if you have um, our, what we're gonna have is 10 printers so it would take only a few days to print all the parts so that would be really good okay next next progress so we we're working on a print cluster here so we came up so this is Christian our new developer and working on on a an architecture for how you take a little little uh, microcontroller like a like a Raspberry Pi so instead of using a computer a computer each to run a 3d printer which takes energy energy uh, computers take a lot of energy just use a small Raspberry Pi microcontroller or microcomputer and connect multiple connect a USB hub with multiple wireless controls these are uh, U UART these are these little wireless modules working through the UART which is a serial thingy and then the then a 3d printer itself has its Arduino with the ramps board with a receiver and an SD card so that you can basically lob over you can throw over the the file using wireless just uh, like remote control wireless style and one single microcontroller microcomputer raspberry pi is controlling the whole cluster so for us it would be about 10 of the 3d printers using a small raspberry pi so very energy efficient so this is the basic geo uh, t say topology or architecture that we came up came up with starting with a computer with freecad with a router with internet and then throwing that onto the raspberry pi and uh, than controlling a bunch of 3D printers with that. So that's in progress. Uh, Christian is working on, uh, he's making instructionals, he's doing really well. Uh, installing the operating, how do you install first an operating system on a Raspberry Pi? Because you're actually going to have to do that. So there's an instructional on Christian log. You can take a look at that. Uh, continuing. Uh, so yeah, more more about Chris, Christian's work on that. Maybe I'll ask ask you to pipe in a little more. Okay, next, next item. So as far as the Microhouse uh, Seed Eco Home, rather, Seed Eco Home goes, we've started the full CAD and free CAD as far as like all the plumbing. This is actually re uh, plumbing for the cisterns, the water cisterns. But the point here is altogether we've been doing a lot of these diagrams with um, just cut out, just basically two-dimensional diagrams where you cut out like visual bill of material style 
you cut out all the parts and piece them together but now now of course which one would you rather have um, I don't have it for reference here but this 3d picture is basically a much more realistic representation the idea here is all these parts were pulled down from McMaster car so that's that's a really efficient way to go and then you can work with a realistic design where a lot of times what you'll see is if you're working in 2D, you can't really picture how the parts go together when you're doing three-dimensional design. So this I actually found this to be just about as fast as doing the two-dimensional uh, renderings while using the real actual parts downloaded. So these are like one-inch PVC fittings and so forth that are actual real parts that we are using in the system. So that's that's an example of using CAD for the house design parts, utilities specifically. What we'll do is, uh, as soon as we have enough people, we can put together a team of people to work on a full utilities CAD. We've got most of the CAD, just about all the CAD for the house and Sweet Home 3D, but the utilities are a major, major, it's like they're taking much longer than we thought. They're experimental, a lot of very interesting stuff. But full CAD needs to happen so that we can then have virtual up to virtual reality walkthroughs. And then at the most elite level of what we can do with 3D CAD like this is make augmented reality instructionals. So something where you're actually wearing glasses, which superimpose information on your field of view so when you so it actually shows you how you put the parts together by providing you with additional information that you see through glasses so this is augmented reality stuff I mean that's something we can aspire to later on as we uh, get the design more complete but that kind of technology is available and there's definitely some things in the open source that are available for augmented reality so we can do that okay so that's uh, house design next filament maker so we've got, um, these are, so we're populating the, the part library of the filament maker with uh, actual 3D designs for all the parts. So like for example here, electronics, we've got simple renderings um, that we are actually doing in FreeCAD. I haven't actually checked how the files look here. We've got that a plenty. Another example is, um, I'm, I'm seeing the thermal components. So we broke down the, on the, uh, Let's see, Lyman filament extruder part library broke down into we broke down the work into many modules. So thermal components, spooler, spooler, spool mechanism, etc. I'm seeing they're getting populated, so that's really good. The next step would be to finish all the different components and and then assemble it into final CAD files. So let's see what else we've got here. So this is the filament maker, the, the current. Uh, current step here is the full CAD that we're working on. Uh, website in progress, uh, Jose, if you want to, let's see, are you here? Uh, no, Jose is not here, but uh, we've got a prototype of the website. So tomorrow I'm, I'm going to be meeting with with Michael, who's working on a backend, revamping our backend and installing the Jitsi uh, video bridge so we can actually go fully open source like hangouts but with unlimited viewers we're in working on installing that and revamping our whole um, back end in the process here so we can look at installing the website um, tomorrow so the idea here is you can once again go into view mode, present, and you can look at this video. He, he did a video explaining what he's got so far on the website. So, um, so let's get to the question questions in a little bit, but let's just go through quickly on the, the progress on the main critical path for the team. So if you take click on the link on page number two here, you can actually be taken to this real diagram, uh, which is actually open for editing, so we can contribute to that. But what's happening here? Uh, the basic idea is uh, the, the green line represents the current time, but you see we're working on a bunch of little projects, and we're going to add the CB press. Uh, we're actually going to have to start working on that because there's two main events happening if you, under the workshops column there uh, or row. The uh, I want to see if we can do the 3D printer workshop 
the 12th of August. So yeah, pushing this way, way later than we think, but uh, 12th looks realistic because we got to get the the print cluster going to print all the parts for that workshop. We're going to need a lot of parts. And then the 25th of August is the CB Press Power Cube Workshop where we build a power cube and a brick press for a client, which is the University of Utah, actually. Uh, they have a design build architecture section where they're building houses for uh, underprivileged people like um, some of the Native American reservations and stuff. They've had projects, but we're providing a CEB press for them. They're coming over, a few of their students, to actually build the press. We're hosting a whole workshop around that. That's a big time on the 25th where, where with the CNC torch table, we'll be cutting all the parts. So this is going to be one of the firsts where uh, outside of some initial part cutting for tractors in the 2012 production run, we've never used a CNC torch table since because we never got it to the level of refinement and now we're working on an automatic height controller and height control to make it fully operational for part cutting for the CNC um, using CNC for the brick press and power cube and if that actually is in, in good shape enough, we can actually consider cutting some of the frames for D3D, the 3D printer. Um, I'm not banking on that, but um, we are definitely cutting the parts for the brick press for uh, using our, our CNC torch table. So uh, just going through all of these here, how they, this fits together, the CNC circuit mill is, the, the current progress is to refine those uh, circuit milling capacity so we can get very reproducible meaning like 80% success rate on the very fine circuit boards that are point that have 0.5 millimeter traces so that's like really tight it's it's not this not this rough one millimeter or a couple of mi millimeter end milling this is very very fine traces so you can actually do things like even make your own Arduinos and other parts and etc so very interesting idea that we talked about is when we do the 3D printer or in the future actually um, CNC circuit mill workshops. So sometime in the future we're going to have, I don't know when, but I'm going to put a workshop there. Um, once again, the one day build where you learn how to build a CNC circuit mill. But also how about using one of the built CNC circuit mills to mill its own electronics, maybe the power supply or its controller. So we're looking at very exciting workshops with that. But we're refining it to get full capacity on that. And so so let me just state the importance of the CNC circuit mill, like why it's quite exciting. Nobody on this planet has actually done a circuit mill with belts um, that gets this type of resolution, this 0.5 millimeter trace width. This is a first, and, and by doing a very solid frame and this doubled up axis, we're, it looks like we're going to be really able to achieve that using GT2 6mm wide belts and pulleys. So using a very, very uh, brute force kind of a drive system. Typically people use, um, use um, lead screws or threaded threaded drive systems to get this kind of precision. But the facts are, uh, if you want to look at some numbers, the step size on the stepper motor, if you do the math, you're actually getting 0 0.01 millimeter, so one hundredth of a millimeter step size on the actual, what you see here in this picture, the actual step size of what the stepper motor can resolve is 10 microns. That's 0.01 of a millimeter. So that means if the machine is tight, if the structure is tight, if the belts are tight, you can get 10 micron resolution, which is perfectly fine for milling very precise circuits like that. Uh, so the theory says it's possible and we're pursuing and in, in doing that. Okay, back to, so that's the relevance, why the CNC, this is really cool because you can then have a very low cost CNC circuit mill, high pre very, very high precision, the best there is, um, and you can do it with belts, very cool. Okay, print cluster, uh, that's ongoing, I'm going to be working on this week really getting all those 10 up and running, 
so we can do the torch table part printing and then part printing for the actual 3D printer workshop. So the torch table, um, this column here, the build is coming up. I mean, I got to start that up next week here because uh, we're going to start have to start some parts. In the meantime, Oliver was is, has been doing the electronics design and so the prototype, including the manual height control. So that's awesome. I'm going to be building that uh, next week. This this week, I'm going to still have to focus on finishing the 3D printer cluster and testing out the code and the Arduino, the, the Raspberry Pi, doing that as far as the print cluster, um, which which Christian is is doing a great job on in terms of the print cluster software and protocol process for that software and hardware for that. Build coming up next week. Uh, at that point, uh, I'll install the height controller. If we have the automatic controller, that'll be great. If not, we'll use the manual controller. And then it's part cutting. That's like in a couple of weeks. So we're really rolling on that. Uh, part cutting towards the end of July, two or three weeks from now. Um, we got to roll. So the workshops... Uh, as far as getting the announcement, the announcement for the 3D printer, that has to go up by next week uh, to give people a full month of lead time to sign up for the workshop. And then uh, CEB Press has to be announced the week after. So we give people a month, uh, a good month of lead time, a month and, uh, and a week here. So that would be good. Wow, time is flying here. Boy. And then tractor team, as we get the Saudi Arabian contributors, which we're interviewing right now, a number of them, uh, we're going to start rolling with that uh, probably next week. And we're going to rope in Emmanuel, who's interested on uh, one of our early devs, the green belt developer, um, who is going to join back on that team since he's very interested in that. But the idea there is, uh, a one, like a, in a recruiting process, What's happened is the uh, one of the developers who applied said, "Hey, I've got this hacker space. I'm working on a on a makers initiative for the North Africa Mid East region, and he's got a lot of collaborators there. So that looks like a really promising collaboration where we're looking at a very big 3D printer build in December, where we build a hundred 3D printers in a single day. That's going to be a major, major undertaking." So, so those are the same guys. Okay, maybe uh, then I can open up the floor to, to, f uh, for other people, to fill me in on any things that we missed, anything from people that are on the call to fill in the gaps of where we are and the status. Um, maybe start with Oliver. Uh, maybe update us, please, where you are. If I missed anything. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Would you mind speaking a little louder? You're you're a little soft here, or maybe. Yeah. Okay, there. Yep. Yep. Is it better like this? Well, definitely. It might have been my my sound too. Okay. Yes, definitely better. Please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I've made um, three PCBs, and yeah. what I can see from here is that I'm pretty sure that the circuits are running correctly. Mm -hmm. Um. I, I was just uh, short before finished with soldering, but um, I've um, made a little test rig, and mm -hmm. um, I for that I utilized a firmware which I found, which was from the work from Aiden Williamson, which was, so far as I can see, the last I worked on this. It's from 2014. And yeah, I was able to find his last Arduino code and use that as a firmware. And um, <clears throat> it seems to work how far, or I could say from my testing, that um, I think it's, it's basically working. Uh -huh. And um, I was able with, with that test trick to um, um, do some, some um, um, yeah, measurements over a distance of five centimeters and I was able to see continuously variations in the signal. Oh yeah. wow. Um, you can you can see if you go a little bit deeper you can see the test rig. 
Okay. So the t uh, um, tell us about that. How yeah. how did that work? Tell us more. Yeah, there it is. You see, it's a really really simple uh, structure. I've just um, taken a plate of copper, and as a sensor probe, I have just taken uh, the probe of my oscilloscope. Uh huh. And so it's quite primitive. So, but with this, I could, as I said, achieve. Uh, uh, small variations in the signal, but it was in a very low um, range. Like the normal um, range is about eight picofarad, and here we are more in the range of of femtofarad, meaning a uh, factor a thousand smaller. Mm -hmm. But um, the thing is, here I mentioned the probe from the oscilloscope, which has a very uh, sharp uh, tip. Yeah, and normally you one should have this ring. So um, uh, what I yeah. what I found in the literature from Aiden and so on was that probably a bigger probe or a ring probe yeah. uh, would give a maybe stronger signal. Yeah, as the signal is also quite quite noisy and and sensitive against any EMF influences and things, but this was really just the first test yeah. to see if my my uh, boards are working correctly. If I soldered everything correctly, and I think that is the case, so that in principle I can send you one of these boards. Wow! From now because everything what happens from here now will probably take place in the in the software and the firmware and so on, which which we can update by internet. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And mm -hmm. the challenge from here now is to um, yeah to make a better signal and then to implement it with the other motor handling stuff. And um, yeah, this is the next thing I'm going to do is try to building a sensor with ring, and for this using maybe a bit shorter cable. This cable what I have here on the probe is about one meter maybe. It's getting better if you go to 20 or 30 centimeters, and um, yeah, I hope the ring will bring uh, um, a clearer signals. At, at the moment, the signal to noise ratio is a little bit coarse, I think. And um, but there is some hope. I've seen there was in the year 2015 a dialogue between I, Adam and a guy named Clement Sivkovic which also tried to rebuild the setup and was probably able to um, achieve even better results. I have uh, put a link on a YouTube video what he made. It is in my log page, the discussion page. There, There is a link to that video. And uh -huh. there you can see relative good resolution in a range of one one centimeter what he's doing so i i think it, it it might be possible in principle but um there will be maybe uh yeah, not fight uh, uh, a challenge to to get better shielding grounding whatever stuff is helpful to get uh, the signal clearer i think the software so far as well the circuit so far are well and now comes the yeah yeah, that's a, that's that's a, that's a video. Oh, yeah. so that shows the capacitive measurement, like voltage. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah, and uh, he he measured about I think ten millimeters, and in variation steps of uh, zero point one millimeters. So that gives hope huh. that in general that could be achievable. Achievable. Wow. Um, yeah. That is that's pretty good. I haven't seen this thing. This is good. This uh, went out into the wild, and some people picked up on it to actually take some real measurements. Excellent for finding that. Um, yeah, and um, a big applause also to Aiden who documented this well. I've also sent the link. He, he had to put all his email um, um, discussion with that guy into a PDF file and has linked it to the log. I did some detective re research to, to follow all the traces and followed all the things but he has well done yeah so far it, it saved me a lot of work to find this and to be able to use this uh, firmware and so on so uh, it's a typical case of 
you know, maybe the saying, we are standing on the shoulder of shoulder of giants. <laughs> yes. Yeah, this is a good example. Excellent. Example for this. Aiden, yeah. you are yeah, a I'm giant, sure. and I'm going to send you this video. <laughs> okay, this is excellent. Yeah. That's that's awesome how we're building. Uh, a good example of how, because it's documented, we're actually able to take the work that was done a couple of years ago and completely take off where we left off at that time, which is good. Very nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I may add one point more that is um, about uh, the sampling. Um, Theoretically, um, it would be maybe able to do some software filtering stuff like simple averaging to, to get a better signal. Yeah? But the um, point is that the, the sensor sampling is quite slow, I would guess, or estimate maybe in the range of 500 milliseconds per sample. That means you have not very much time. Mm. To, to get a whole bunch, you cannot do an, av an average about n equal thousands or something, but maybe oh, there's wow. something possible in the range of, of, of 10 or something. I don't know yet or have no real imagination how fast the, the torch is moving forward. You said it's more slowly moving, and I mean, on the other hand, one can, can maybe wait at one point until the, the, the sampling is done, however, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to play with that and uh, try uh, to maybe do an average about more samples and from this also get a bit of better signal. But um, my main hope is uh, on, the, on the ring sensor and that will be uh, my next step. Yeah, and as I mentioned, if you want, I can send you one of the boards over and you can also do some testing with it. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, the speed that we're talking about is about one centimeter per second, which is, uh, in English, that's 20 inches per minute for half-inch mm -hmm. steel. That's a, probably uh, about one fast. centimeter, about one centimeter per second, right? Because that's about 50 yeah. centimeters per minute, so about a centimeter per second. Yeah. Um, how do you know, let me ask you this question, when you say the you're measuring picofarads, uh, how do you get that value? So there's some kind of scaling that you're doing already to... Yeah. Con how, are you, how are you doing that? Yeah. Um, I, I've um, mounted the thing, the, the probe on, 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 on a on a linear drive and then moved it, I marked uh, five marks in, in a distance of one centimeter, so five centimeters each, and then I move it forward, moved it forward one centimeter and then the next centimeter and so on, and meanwhile letting uh, lock the, the sensor data on the, on the serial monitor of the Arduino IDE. And, um, um, at the first place, I got a value which is about 8.193 uh, picofarad. Interestingly, that is the same value which Aiden also reported that he gets at one point. And uh, first, it seemed to be this value, but if you take a closer look, and then you see three places behind the, the point, see some, yeah, more or less regularly uh, uh, numbers uh, which you can relate to if you're doing the moving forward meaning getting closer to the uh, plate to the surface then the values are arising constantly it's not probably not a real linear linear arising um, it's more like a, what's the word like a parable uh -huh. Like like we have seen in the video of Klimen Bikovic, it, it, it gets uh, uh, closer than to to or to one one uh, saturation point, or if if you go yeah yeah more and that, away like this yeah. And how do you get the scaling to to correlate the two picofarads? So you've got what yeah, like um, I then when I saw that that this happened, I I simply uh, subtracted a value of eight point. 193 of it and then multiplied it by 100,000 and then I get a more um, a more ergonomic uh, scaling on my screen which 
is a, a, a two two part number like 22, 23, 24, and so on. And uh, when I move in total the distance of five centimeters in the beginning, I'm in the range of a value of 20, what I call femtofarad. Let's say 20 femtofarad. And uh, if I'm um, close to the to the surface, then I have 40. So I have a range of of 20 uh, from 20 up to 40 means distance of 20 uh, uh, femtofarad in which I have here uh, the five centimeter distance. And it seems that in the nearer range, it's getting better or sharper. And in the in the more distant range, it's a bit, uh, or it's more noisy or un unclear or like that. But I, I think this is all not quite um, meaningful because we still have not the right sensor set up. So, yes. but it was enough for me to see um, there is happening something regularly, which let me assume that uh, at least I have uh, soldered the boards correctly and also. Uh, designed them so far or I have, I've uh, copied the design correctly. Like yeah, this. I think this and is, yeah. yeah, I think that's really good progress that you're actually seeing that with like the, the oscilloscope probe, which, which really has no capacitance. There's a very small surface area. I think um, yeah. that you have succeeded seeing something with that. That's, that's a miracle right there. That's, that's great. So we can continue. Yeah. That's true, and I, I, I remember one point in the reports of my ancestors where they also did the jump from a smaller diameter of the sensor to a bigger diameter, and that seem also had to uh, had some made some uh, resulted in some good progress. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's that's my hope. But I just wanted to. I, I was ready with soldering, wanted to see something, and this thing yeah. was handy. And I mean, uh, when I build a real pro, a real sensor, then uh, a, a small a second advantage is that I have my probe from my oscilloscope back, and then I can do some measurings with my oscilloscope <laughs> on the on yeah. This thing. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, and by the way, one other thing is, um, yep. I did my my test run two times. First, I moved uh, the carriage with the probe by hand. And then secondly, I let the carriage move by the manual height uh, torch controller, which we made last time. And um, when the, the electronics, there is a power supply and stuff was near it, then it was getting a little bit more noisier than when I did it from, from hand. So I, I guess the, the, the general challenge will be to, to, to fight the noise, to make better grounding, shielding and stuff like that yeah but but even there i i could could uh, uh, see the continuously arising or decreasing of 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 the, of the value so mm -hmm. that's it's also hope <laughs> yeah no that's that is great progress so yeah uh excellent work so we'll continue doing that and in the meantime i can um definitely implement your next week so next week i'm hoping to implement your manual torch controller solution as well so that's good and we can definitely get some initial cuts on the cnc torch table so moving right along uh, be really cool i mean uh, we are double ways on the safe side i mean even if the uh, sand cap sensing circuits uh -huh. part would not be working what yeah. what doesn't seem to be the case but even if um, then at least you can use my board uh, as a hand control thing. Yeah, that's of course uh, implemented in it. And uh, as far as I can see, the Arduino Nano seems also be a good um, um, choice in this uh, setup. So it's useful anyway. <laughs> yeah, because the same board can be made to do um, like what you designed the the other system. I mean, can this be adapted readily to the manual height control you'd still yes, need a I mean, it yeah. can be if, if, if my board reach you uh, earlier then you are ready to rebuild the thing with the arduino mega then you could instead uh, immediately use this yeah yeah okay excellent work okay 
very very good so we'll continue we'll continue on to the next topic here and just keep going thanks a lot mm -hmm. next is uh, let's move to the filament maker work as far as what all has been has happened there um, who wants to report in on that I haven't studied in detail exactly what the status is uh, Vixen do you want to pipe in on what uh, what all has transpired there um, I can pipe in but unfortunately this week was kind of bust for me so I haven't studied it in detail either but if you look at the part library you can see on top of this it's getting populated with pictures and some here let me paste the link so everyone can look at it easily if you want. Um, it's getting populated there's free CAD files for some of the um, I guess non-printed parts which is good because those are some of the uh, ones that will probably take a little more work I think and um, yeah so there's some population happening and I added a slide to the end of this dev team meeting where I just have uh, the small amount of work I was able to do. Um, I just wanted to check that I uploaded one free CAD file for the um, extruder barrel that you can see right there, that four inch, four and a half inch hole. And just link to that page. So I uploaded first the unsimplified, there I've pasted the link to yeah. that file. I uploaded first the unsimplified version that I got directly from either Fastenal or McMaster Car. I can't remember uh -huh. where it came from. And that's 929 kilobytes. And then I uploaded another version, which is now the current version, that's the simplified version, where there's no threads or anything. It's um, There's a smaller space for the threads to visualize where they're at, but that's down to five kilobytes. And I just yeah. want to make sure for intending when you described in the part simplification video um, using this versioning thing so that we can have both the unsimplified and simplified. Like that's that's what you're hoping to have for all the part, right? Exactly. So that's that's right on going from nine hundred to five. That's a definite, definite major uh, reduction. And just to see how it works, I mean, that's perfectly fine. Yeah, that, that represents, uh, that's 5K, and it represents where the threads are. So that's exactly what we're looking for. And when you do the saving, like when you view it, go to perspective view, so it looks kind of more in perspective, like when you do screenshots and so forth. But that's okay. exactly exactly what we need. So that, that okay. kind of, well, yep. Yeah, we'll use that part as a reference for how to do that, I guess. Yeah, uh, is that linked in slide 16 or side panel corner bottom? bottom. Um, and, and then the, the one other thing I had in there is uh, some of the file names I had made had slashes in them, and OSC Linux doesn't seem to like that. I was oh, just wondering if a resource had been made for file conventions uh, in regards to OSC Linux at this point. Uh, sorry, say the question again regarding file conven convention for OSC Linux. Uh, I was trying to save some of the files as the way I had named them in the part, part library and OSC Linux. I got unfortunately I've lost the screenshot of the error, but OSC Linux was telling me um, no slashes and file names, which is obvious to me at this point now because that's the way it usually is. I was just wondering if um, I was wondering if there was a file name convention resource on the wiki yet yeah not, no don't that. have it I think I think what you have let's just keep going with it um, we'll get there um, I think we can handle this with just doing reasonable file names like LFX Lyman film and extruder nipple black iron excellent yeah um, okay. so let's see what about Roberto also says what about cat files with the same object but with different position how to put them in a library like uh, different positions, like different viewpoints, different modifications, they could go simply up, I would say just upload them over an existing file. So if you show something interesting, like even if it's recoloring parts in a different way or adding an explode part animation or whatever, anything that you change, you can simply upload as a new version and just make the notes that that's 
what's uh, happening in that specific version. So that's, does that answer the question, Roberto? Hopefully, hopefully that, that answers it. And continuing on Roberto log here, so we've got, yeah, so he piped in this, this, um, this one right here, but this is, this is what we're trying to do here. So basically n label all the parts for that particular um, module. So like here, for example, we have, I see, we didn't really say who has what outside of the working document. So let's go back to the working document and look at the allocation of the different tasks. Okay, um, so an alignment film and extruder page, we have the working doc from last last week. Do we have that there? It should be there, what, we, what we were allocating people to. So let's just open up that document here. Yeah, so here is what we have. So for example, Roberto here, big box enclosure plus hopper. Uh, so then we have the resulting product right here. That's that's excellent work right there and on his log. So that's what we wanted to have from everyone just to keep good track of what all the parts are covered already. Like if these are already linked, what I'm expecting here Look at that. Final assembly with sketches, without sketches. Let's uh, let's go to this one. Okay, so Roberto has done some good work here. Uh, so let's just take a look at the download of that. So, so far what we're seeing is, uh, is the complete workflow that we discussed last week, which is label all the parts, link to the files, then for each one of these I would be expecting that to go to the wiki and to the actual FreeCAD file as it does. So this diagram here shows me that all these parts uh, do have links and therefore this looks like it's very complete. And then you look at the final assembly here of 20 parts and it is there. So after downloading that I'm gonna just double click on that Let's, let's look at what the final product looks like in FreeCAD. Uh, so that's great work and therefore the uh, other people who are working on on the same um, on the let me close some right here so Abe, Will, Cassie, Io, Israel and Dixon. Yep um, the idea would be to do what Roberto has done on that. Let me see if this is opening up here. Ah, look at that. So that's Roberto's product. And that's looking very sweet. Um, very nice. So, yeah, so you can see all the different pieces I'm gonna hide and unhide them but basically there should be yeah stripping all the parts corner panel corner panel extruder case front panel hopper knob side panel fan bracket and bottom panel wow that's great so that's exactly what we're looking for and then once we have this I mean this is like pretty much ready to be printed I guess in full so this is uh, pretty good this gives me an idea like I could take this download all the files and start printing now the the one thing for printing so so say let's go back to the document right here so also if I go to Roberto's log I would want to see okay excellent so there's all the all the files 
for the free CAD and the next step would be also just export the individual files and just say okay the same thing but that SDL and the so then I, then I can go down this list download the 20 SDLs and hit print now um, the numbers of them like in this diagram we should have a corner panel I think this is that you print each one of them just once because they're breaking broken down looks like what we have here is they're broken down to the individual part such that uh, the printing is just simply one one print of each um, and that is good yeah and then on this specific case the next would be some of the heater element but that's another module isn't that so if we go to so yeah the thermal components like this the extruder barrel auger and flange once that is done we can append that like here we have that box blocking out the extruder barrel and so forth so that is pretty good like and if we have that now the auger let's see the auger yeah so that's all in Dixon's work the auger plus flange extruder barrel and a way to mount the auger to the to the drive motor I guess uh, spooler I guess in this system what, what I'm seeing is that we kind of missed the uh, the motor drive part which I think I'm gonna just add that I'm gonna add that to Dixon's since you're pretty much ah so in this working document what you see this is good work by Roberto but yeah that this is in the working document itself uh, I just keep skipping up every time I press it yeah so we're supposed to paste in the finished finished assemblies into this document but that's that's really good so what I can do is um, literally I mean if I get a, the first chance to start printing I can start printing these all these elements and what I meant to say is that uh-huh extruder electronic module visual index so this here what I'm seeing is yeah part of the this is I think or is that Abe is that electronics by Abe that's correct so he's he's part way done through the the visual diagram with all the parts linked to the files so for Roberto um, he's the farthest along and the next step on, on this here would be just to export and link to all the STL files and as soon as that's done I mean I can I think I can start printing this within a week or so um, once I get the cluster so the main goal for me is get all the cluster going this week so I can print things in mass so we've got competing devices to be printed there's the torch table there's more printer parts and there's now the filament maker so as you see the the 3d printer is a very very important tool in fact we'll be printing some of the the drawer rail guides for the brick press also using the the 3d printer so good work um, excellent excellent um, now do we cover everybody that's the progress of everybody that's in the meeting right now or anyone have any other maybe about the cluster yes sir Christian why don't you fill us in where we are on that that's an exciting project that has major progress and uh, please go ahead fill us in where exactly you are we cannot hear you see if you can maybe unmute yourself or restart restarting typically works or otherwise uh, we need your voice and a quick reminder in the meantime everybody please fill out your timesheet if you have done work 
here. We've logged seven people this week. I think there should be a couple more. Christian, yeah, see if you can... Hello? Yeah, there you go. Please go ahead. We can hear you. Is it... Ah, uh, all right. Okay. So, um, I've started with the 3D printed cluster, and I've written... Um, and I've researched about how, how we get to this, um, how much is done uh, with open software by now, and we've come to the conclusion that for... Um, for hosting those different um, uh, printers, uh, we will use Octoprint. This is um, mm -hmm. open, so uh, open source already, and it's been around for a few years now. It's pretty um, pretty refined. It has also, um, like it was mentioned before, it has the option to uh, load the software up to the S uh, not the software, the G code up to the DSD card. So there's nothing new or special um, that we have to do for that. Um, so we, we took this as a basis. However, uh, the biggest problem about that is that it's only designed for one printer at a time. So it's not really a cluster. It's simply a management system for a single printer. Uh -huh. So what I was working on was the... Um, was the management how to expand this for multiple printers and this is possible it has been done um, however only on a small scale no more than two with, with documentation as far as I could see it so um, I had to write on scripts that automate the process of um, of, of pulling the, the printers together uh -huh. and that's exactly what I did um, I can't demonstrate this right here because for one, I don't have a 3D printer, uh -huh. <laughs> and for the other, um, this only makes sense if there are multiple 3D printers, of course, because otherwise uh, this kind of software won't make any sense. Right. Um, that's that's the reason why we need to set up this thing on your Pi as soon yes. as possible, mm -hmm. so um, I can use this scanner I've written in, in Python. This uh, thing automatically detects all um, of uh, connected 3D printers and sends them a G code that's analyzing um, that that sends basic information. It's M115 for Marlin, um, and it's just sending back uh, the printer's name and so uh, firmware and, and stuff like that. And um, the name is then written down and kind of organized in an, in an own file, in a little file, and um, the setup is then um, corrected accordingly to the amount of, of 3D printers and also uh, according to the names of the 3D printers. So they all have individual names um, given to them on the firmware, so we can um, take the, um, keep them apart and give them special names like uh, for, for different types of filament or for several uh, extruders and stuff like that so we can um, distinct them. Um, yeah, that, that's what I was working on. That's, that's one thing. And another thing is I'll just shortly uh, share my screen for that. Yeah. Um, I've written additionally a little web server because each instance that a manager's a 3D printer will then um, result in um, in an own in an own website in in its way, but but not not an online website, but um, an HTTP um, thing. Um, yeah. And this is a problem because then we have let's say 10 or 20 websites that are apart from each other and with different URLs and that would be just a pain. So I've um, worked on a unifying a website that pulls them all together. Um, and that looks a bit like this at the moment. Can you see it? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So I've just, it's, it's, it's pretty basic actually. It's, it's a little bit of bootstrap, so it looks pretty nice. Uh, we've got here a few settings, so we can scan for new devices here. Um, and restart the machine. 
uh, I've got a big copyright here. We'll fill in what's what's necessary. We can put in here widgets or stuff uh, we think is necessary for the for the rep lab. Uh, um, configuration and stuff and one button is here the first button is the 3d printer managing the cluster and nice. these are only dummies they will be created dynamically according to the 3d printers as I have none I, I've just inserted some dummies and when I click on them they're dynamically loaded so um, oh nice here is the octoprint and we can wow. here upload uh, to the system and then to the SD card. Uh, we have temperature here. Wow. Um, and of course, this will take the default settings for different printers. So we have to talk later on um, how this will exactly look like. And whenever we are, we are switching between those, it will automatically load um, the most current um, system. So not everything is loaded at once. Because that would be a lo huge load for the for the Raspberry Pi, but each um, but each tab here will be loaded only when clicked upon. Yeah. So um, this will optimize the efficiency and will make this much more scalable. I think. Yeah. Wow, this um, is very cool. Tell me, yeah. what what language are you programming this interface in? This uh, this is Python Flask, so it's mainly Python, but it's yeah, it's it's actually not that difficult. It looks so nice only because of, because I was using Bootstrap. That that's all. I've just copy pasted a bit of Bootstrap. It, it it just looks nice. It's actually pretty simple. It doesn't involve any JavaScript except the uh, automatically loading. Of course, this needs JavaScript, but it, this is only to make it even more efficient. So it's just two hundred kilobytes or something like that. So it's as simple as it can as it can be. So it can um, just do all of these things on the Raspberry Pi without any kinds of lags and with scalability up to maximum. Very nice, very yeah. nice. Uh, do you have, uh, I'm looking at your log, do you have any, uh, where's the source code for that? Do you have that up on? Uh, yeah, GitHub? yeah, uh, um, I'll stop. The, the screen sharing. So um, yeah, I've, I've uploaded a zip file. Uh, I've linked that in my in my log, uh -huh. and everything uh, I did on my um, on my Python to get this uh, web server and stuff lo uh, loading. Um, I've got all of this in a step by step um, process, and I've created a wiki page on how to make out of the octopi image. That's the basic of the octoprint. Um, to make out of this the system I have right now. Additionally to that, there are all the all the Python scripts and stuff I've created. However, they are mainly untested, so um, they will be just there and they will be of course updated. And it's about 400 kilobytes, um, so it's pretty simple, it's pretty basic actually. Like I said, the HTML is as simple as possible. The, the HTML sites themselves are only 2 to 5 kilobytes, I think. So uh -huh. it's basically nothing. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and Python scripts don't take up much of space. It's five or six kilobytes, I think, for the Octo scanner, for, for, for the scanner, for the 3D printers. That's basically all. Everything else is just little management uh, files I, I need for uh, for expanding the, these for the default setup. Excellent. Yeah. And I see you have the link to the source code, or no, the instructions for take. Let's see. Look at these instructions. Yeah. How to create print I've, printer I've tested cluster. I've the instructions um, myself, so, so I've made this thing go go blank again, and then set it up like like in the instructions and it works. So it's as simple as possible um, with those instructions. Yeah. So that's yeah. Uh, my current status. And for further um, working, I just need your assistance on how exactly the 3D printers should be managed and of course on testing it upon your printers or at least one printer to look how the uh, software identifies the 3D printers. Excellent. And uh, let's see. So that's, um, I just downloaded your print cluster extract here. So if I take a look at your print cluster data.zip so, how do I take that and install that on my my computer? So, 
so so it's of course nothing for your computer it's for your raspberry pi and the instructionals uh, I've written in there are pretty accurate about that, uh -huh. um, but I can describe it right now in short. If you open the zip file, you, you haven't activated screen sharing anymore, so, so I can't see what you're doing. But if you unzip it, there's a readme, and inside this readme there is everything uh, you have to do with this thing um, to get going. So it's pretty sim as simple as that. Uh, if there are any further questions, like I said, the wiki page is actually even more accurate. Uh, the readme is just uh, the most simple, um, most simple steps. So you're saying the, the readme is um, how to create the printer cluster image. So basically, you're you're creating um, an SD card, right, with the with the operating system for the Raspberry Pi. Is that correct? Um, Maybe maybe I've misformulated that, but it's a bit difficult on that. I will create the printer cluster image with that. At the moment, there is none. So I'll upload a modified version of the Octopi to the to the site. However, um, as we want to be as transparent as possible, I want also to document on how I've created this image. So this is how this image is created, and this is nothing I do on the image. But I've just write it onto his DSD card, boot up the Pi, and then I follow the instructions um, left here uh, via SSH, like I, like I also said in the scroll down. You'll see uh, what kind of, of, of uh, orders, uh, how do you say that, what, what kind of li uh, the lines I, I put in to get the software exactly like this with me mm -hmm. uh, on, on my side. I see. Okay. Um, yeah. Right. So let me let me just yeah, uh, clarify for everyone. So, um, how to write an image to the SD card, and then how to create a printer cluster image. What's the difference between the two? Um, the the uh, the writing to the SD card means uh, I'm taking a blank hard drive or a SD card in that case. The, it, it's it's kind of the HDD or SSD of the of the of the Raspberry Pi is the SD card, and this has to have some kind of operating system. So the basic operating system we need on the on the SD card is the Octopi. So I put the SD card into my computer, and I've written a little wiki page there as well, uh, writing the image to the SD card. Um, yeah, it's the June thirtieth entry there, right here. Yep. So right. how you do that? Exactly. Uh huh. Um, and how, how I put this on with OC Linux. Um, and after this is written, I can just insert this hard drive or SD card into the Raspberry Pi right. and plug it in. So it just will boot up by default, and it will just yeah, like like I said, it will boot up and it will get into the network as yeah. long as you've provided either an Ethernet cable or you put in the credentials of your uh, Wi-Fi. This is also described in the SD card setup. Yeah. Uh, so it will be automatically be inside your router, uh, in, inside your network, sorry. And you can then SSH to it. So this means uh, a command line, um, command line connection to your um, Raspberry Pi. And then you can do all kinds of things. It's, um, you can also do this with a screen there's however no GUI so it's no it has no fancy desktop it's just a white white blinking line in your computing orders this is all and the orders you need to get the software I have is just left on the second wiki page so the okay. first thing is more general you can uh -huh. set up any kind of operating system for the Pi with the first uh -huh. uh, you can actually set up uh, OC Linux with those uh, commands as well okay however okay. I wouldn't advise an SD card, I would advise a USB stick, but it works basically the same. Uh -huh. And the second one is actually making out of the specific uh, Octopi image okay, our okay. personal image we will use for RepLab, especially for the 3D printer cl uh, 3D cluster. Yeah, yeah. 3D well, printer cluster. One comment on RepLab so that's the replicating, self replicating open source Fab Lab. That's a term we used actually a long time ago. We haven't used that term of rep lab, but it's um, 
that's that's for anyone who's wondering what RepLab is. It's another name for our open source microfactory, open source fab lab, for everybody. I've actually used this term because it, I, I found this most often, and it seemed to be the most uh, universal term you have for this. Yeah. So. Um, um, I, I've just used this because I, I thought maybe the server, um, I don't think it will be kind of, uh, it will be overheated because of simply the, uh, the few printers it manages, as, especially as it only distributes the, the uh, files to the SD cards and then just will be idle. So I thought maybe this is kind of uh, viewable also in my design of the, um, of the main of, of this website. Mm -hmm. um, we can add other um, maintaining, uh, managing functions, or maybe just widgets for for measuring or or just converting files, stuff like that. Yep. So this is kind of the main brain of the of the of the Rep Lab, maybe in the future. Yeah. We've just created it to be uh, adaptable in that way. Right. And as far as the print cluster data dot zip, the thing you showed on your screen share, that's what actually goes on your laptop, right? No, no, not, not, there's, there's nothing, nothing on the laptop, actually. After you, you set up this, you download the, the zip file, you also unpack this onto your SD card. And okay. you can do this, actually, also with the command line. There's one um, command okay. that's called okay. wget. You uh -huh. can download or files from websites with wget. Okay. I've, I've linked how this is used. It's a pretty, pretty simple command. And you can then get it directly from the wiki, and then you can unzip it, and then you can just um, move the files that are inside this accordingly to the step-by-step uh, -step, um, tutorial I've, I've set up. Very nice. I've put, put it in there um, where to put, uh, where, how, what file is going where. Okay, so, yeah. so, so just to get the architecture clear here. So we're going to use our laptop with OSE Linux or Linux. And we're going to create the SD card that, that then is used to install the operating system on the Raspberry Pi. Once we have that, we're going to communicate with the Raspberry Pi via the laptop and then have the Raspberry Pi. We're going to put on this other printer cluster software onto the Raspberry Pi through the through our laptop. Is that correct? Exactly. Okay. We're configuring it to, to make it uh, our, special, um, th uh, our special OS. However, I'll... At the end, I'll load up um, uh, uh, an image that's already finished. So you only have to make uh, do step one. So just okay. have to put this into your laptop and set this up, and everything else will then be fine and already done. So this is just for the expert or those who like the transparency to do all themselves. Um, yeah, it's more or less for the for the logging. Yep, that's excellent. The main reason. Uh huh. And as far as within our print cluster here, we, we were uh, on the June 27th date. We've got the full bill of materials that I need to order and get yeah. going with that. Excellent. Yeah, I, I forgot, mm -hmm. I've forgotten actually about the hardware side. So um, like like Marston said at the beginning, we're, we're using this wireless communication between the different, uh, between the Raspberry Pi and the different printers. It's kind of like a like a wired connection, at least from the software side, as there is no differentiation. Um, it's just taken to um, to a radio wave and then sorry, and then connected to each uh, to each other via this this wave. And there are different channels you can adapt. So every um, every three D printer will be on its own channel, kind yep. of. Yep. And yeah, as as you can see on the on the on the bill of materials, um, we'll have one one USB port for for, for everything for every three D printer, then one one USB to, to to serial, and then put in the wireless um, on on the side of the of the Raspberry Pi, one wireless um, receiver on the side of the printer. And of course, an SD card on the side of the printer, and that's actually more or less it. Yep. So I'm looking at the bill of materials, and it's about eighty-five dollars. To that would be for four, that's a four-channel hub, so to to control four printers. Right. 
that's uh-huh. that's about it, right? It's about um, about that. Uh huh. So it's relatively so, low um, cost. That's good. What what I wanted to say about the USB hub, there there are cheaper options out there, but I wasn't quite sure on their quality. So this is just uh, an Amazon link. There are prices about half of this. They can be USB two. This isn't a problem. It just should be powered. There are other options out there. Um, so I don't I don't know um, how it, how it is uh, with with the other options. Mm-hmm. You can just look around for yourself. If you, I'm I'm just not in the American market. I'm I'm not searching that much therefore for hardware, so I can't. Yep. Uh, I'm I, I don't know whether there are places where this is uh, this is available and for cheaper price. Yeah. I don't yeah. Know. Yeah, very nice, yeah. very nice. So next step would be for me to get all the parts and put the system together so I can test it here and get you that. Uh, I have to do the new firmware for the 3D printer so it can identify itself so you can see the name of the printer and I can send that to you. But yeah, this is great, great work. Uh, so please continue. What is your next step right now? So you, you're work, going to work on the getting the whole image for the complete system or, or not yet? I, I can do that, but that, that's not, not actually in, in, in a difficult state, state stage. This can be done within an hour. Um, actually, I'm kind of waiting for you now yeah. because I um, need now kind of feedback on how this is structured. There are several options, especially for the for the octoprint itself. You can set it up in different ways, and I need a kind of a default setup that I copy for each instance. And I have to know how this uh, should be made in a in the most optimal way. Right. And additionally, it probably would be best if you give me an SSH connection to your Raspberry Pi as soon as you as you've set it up, uh, so I can test um, the stuff on it. So uh, because, like I said, that the scanner is totally untested, and I just need to get it through the step by step. And explaining this simply won't do, and right. I don't think it will work out of the box. That's that's simply, that's not how coding works. That's right. right. <laughs> you'll you'll have to test it. Right. Um, so but, how how do I give you an SSH connection to the Raspberry Pi? How do I do that? Um, after it's connected to your um, to your router, you can set it up so it's um, that's that's called port forwarding. You can do this on your router. Uh-huh. And you just set up one specific part, um, and this is then reachable through the internet. And don't panic; SSH is pretty secure, um, so it's as secure as your password is. So you you send me, hopefully, a pretty good password, and then I can log into it and I can communicate with it like I'm sitting next to it. That's that's kind of the oh, way wow. it goes there. It's, so it's pretty easy. So as long as my internet is online and the Raspberry Pi is powered on, you can actually I, uh, test. Access it. Wow. Exactly. That's that's what I was aiming at. Very nice. So you can actually be making a connection to the printer. You can literally be controlling my printer from your house. Yeah, yeah, I, I could actually do that. Um, that's that's a little thing I wanted to 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 add as a kind of bummer to the to the con- current system. I can't set up a real secure way to share this website I've set up um, in a in a secure way everywhere. Uh, this is uh, this has several reasons. The main reason is that the Octoprint has a uh, security system on its own. Uh-huh. But this would mean that on each click you do by on on each on each printer you're 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 choosing you have to log in separately and i think you will agree that that would be just inefficient and just a pain that's, yeah uh, that's just stupid so which uh, if you want to share this over the internet if, as long as it's in your house it's no problem but if you want to share it over the internet you will have to set up some really complicated stuff, and if you want to do that, uh, you should contact me again about that. And this would take actually pretty much time. I, I don't think that that's really worth it. But uh, if you say this is important, then we'll just look into it. I'll, I'll write an API nevertheless, so maybe we can just SSH this connection. I'm, I'm also using. Maybe we can send over this connection 
just uh, commands that, um, that can set up the, the printing process as well uh, huh. without the nice GUI. So um, just, that's... just for giving a single command. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's very interesting in terms of how you can have... Uh... Yeah, towards a remote print cluster, like for example, as an enterprise opportunity, you can actually be renting your print cluster through a remote interface to other people yeah. if they want to use it. That would be <laughs> very interesting. That, 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 that could be done, however, there should be another layer of security. So just kind of the page that's locally there, and there should be a kind of an enterprise page above that, and that could also make the pricing and stuff. So... Um, like I said, this layer of security is only for um, internal Wi-Fi where, where, where there is a secure password available or, or it's just plugged in um, into the Ethernet. So nothing with the Internet that would be horrible because everyone could access your printer and it would be pretty bad. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah that's, yeah, that's very good. Well, that's excellent work. So what I'll do is um, make sure I can get to that step, maybe push that up my priority here but yeah i gotta get you that information first it's that it's about the identity information and i, I basically have to do the get the raspberry pi established here as soon as yeah. i can so i gotta order um, that next thing yeah just get that from amazon yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I i propose actually you, you just call me um on, on some point when you have the raspberry pi and i'll explain to you how to um open the ssh and uh, maybe you can just help me with the next steps on how they should look like exactly okay so yeah I, I propose that yeah yeah definitely all right so with that said right. um, let's see um, in the meantime until that happens do you want to do any of the the Lyman filament extruder work I may look into that but I'm not quite sure on um, <laughs> how, how fast I can get into that. I, I think I can do that, May, maybe. Um, what I wanted to ask uh, you is, um, I've got two little pro projects on on that. One one is the API and one is, the, um, one is, in conver is a converter. Um, so I, I, I thought about maybe you could just upload there an F FCSTD file. And it would just be uh, converted into the SDL equivalent and it directly uploaded into the Octopi, not into the SD card, but the Octopi repository. So you can just uh, use this directly and don't have any kind of conversion going on for that. Would that be of interest? Yeah, uh, so would that be pretty much immediate? You can load the, the FreeCAD file pretty much into the Raspberry yes. Pi and that will do the conversion. And how long would it take? It would be quick. Yeah, so it, it, it would just be a, a button on the website, like, like you know it, when, when you can upload someone, something on the website, it will look about like that. It will be uploaded and then it will be uh, converted in an internal algorithm and then it will be pushed into the um, repository that's, that's um, containing the uploads of the Octoprint. So uh, you can... Um, at once upload it onto your SD card and stuff yeah. and slice it of course and, and so on and so forth yeah if that process if that workflow can be made um, clear and um, no just easy workflow for that yeah yeah that would definitely be interesting so we don't have to generate SDL files whenever we work we just we can just remain at the FreeCAD and, and send them there directly I, I can do that it would take half a gigabyte on the system however it's 1.8 gigabyte at the moment so it's pretty pretty there's there's, there's much, much space left as far as i can see it however i'll need to install freecad upon it so that's this is pretty big um uh -huh. and the process would of course um put the system into a kind of a um, high working state but i don't think it will take too long so uh -huh. um I, I think, think this would be possible and i think i can do this within the week um, yeah, I think that it, it, it appears that that might get in the way of the scalability of the Raspberry Pi system. Uh, do you think it will? Um, well, you shouldn't do multiple at once. That's 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 a thing that could actually 
really be a problem. However, if you do this only one at a time, so it's nothing like you you just there are not ten persons loading up at once, but there's one person that says, ah, I've got an ST FC ST I, I can't I can't spell it. Idea. Sorry. Um, I can I I do this just. Uh, just file by file so so I've got this file and I've got this file and it, then I don't know maybe it will take 10 seconds or something like that that's that's just an estimation I think that will be enough um, mm -hmm. maybe maybe five seconds and mm -hmm. um, so it's it's only a problem if there are multiple this function at, at once I think that that would be a problem mm -hmm. you ha you have to decide whether this this is then still useful or not uh, I, I can't quite um, I can't quite say that if it I mean if it doesn't decrease performance I all, scalability. Only on the upload so so only for a few seconds on, on, on the on the upload itself yeah um, uh, after that there will be enough nothing really that would uh, that would slow it down as far as I can see it the conversion would take I mean that's that's a second that's a fraction of a second or like a few seconds probably a few seconds but uh -huh. outside of that it won't take yeah. process time that would be measurable I don't think so okay so it's, I think that's probably how does everyone else feel about it, it sounds sounds like that's a good good way to go for convenience of printing so you don't have to keep twice the number of files on the wiki because now we have to ma maintain there's the freecat file and then there's the individual print STL. file the stl so to to combine that into one i think that would be that would be quite desirable it seems to me right now unless unless we find some other things that may not work about that workflow yeah that would be good let's go with it yeah, now I'll now try that. okay yeah and phase it yeah and it's like one thing at a time can you actually do that yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think you're do, doing work pretty rapidly, so I think that would be that would be good good to implement that as as we get this uh, Raspberry Pi in house here. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. Okay. Let's try it. That will be great. Then, then I'll do that. And a little last question as uh -huh. well. Um, may, maybe someone has experience with that because I haven't. And if 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 this is a problem, we should of course document that. Uh -huh. And before I test, maybe someone has done this. Um, when it's printing, um, so the Arduino is taking G code from somewhere and just printing and printing and doing stuff. Um, what is happening if you send from a diff different source? So, like I, I'm sending with my scanner, I'm sending a, a code. This is nothing that would stop the machine or something like that it's just resending a, a string or something like that so, so it's just sending a bit of text but uh, would it kind of disrupt the workflow and then just stop altogether or would it just be implemented in the current process as one line would be called back and then it would just go on like 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 nothing happened or what exactly would happen I, I'm not quite sure about that because right. if it's Serving something, then um, we should, of course, warn about the use of the scanner, because every um, printer in the, in the uh, that's that's connected and when when the scanner is used should of course be then in a suspended state or something like that, so nothing uh, gets uh, um, yeah it's disrupted. Sorry, you're talking about a scanner. S scan. No, no, sorry, sorry. I, I mean, my, my Python script, um, uh, what, what I call the scanner, that, that means uh, it's, it's, it's um, collecting the names and stuff uh -huh. from um, yeah. the printer's name. But this, of course, means I, I send some kind of G code to the, um, to the printer. And uh -huh. I don't know what happens if this printer is actually at the moment printing. Okay. I'm not sure about that. Yeah. Well, the way that I don't know how Octoprint Octopi works, but if you look at my screen, uh, if you use, I've been using Cura. So you start the print. Before you print, you can ha you can type in commands in in uh, basically command line to send G code commands to the 3D printer. Once you start, it just runs through your file. That's that's all it does. But also lets you stop yeah. the print. 
and I and I think that probably if you wanted to send some G code commands while it's printing, I don't know how it does that. It might have that capacity. If not, that would have to be added. Um, are you actually savvy enough that you can go into Octoprint and actually start modifying that? Uh, this is not not by Octoprint. This is my own little script uh, for for managing and and analyzing what kind mm -hmm. of of files there are. Yeah. So it's uh, pretty strange. So I, I I can't think of what this will exactly do. I, I yeah. just have no scenario in yeah. my in my head, and Google does doesn't give me any answers about that. Yeah. So I just want to ask maybe. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't... And also, while uh, printing it is sent some. Temperature. Yeah, yeah, that, that's exactly uh, the kind of, of question I mean. So while uh, printing, you can send some commands and th this won't be any problem. That, that's, uh, you've, you've tested that. Um, are you asking me? Or yeah, in the, in the, sorry, sorry, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, group chat. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so yeah, it's it's kind of from different USB port because it's uh, taking the commands from the SD card. So um, um, so it's kind of taking from a different port. Or let's say it it's take it takes it from another source. So thing, uh, what this exactly would do? Well, I, I think we'll have just to to run it. But this uh, sounds pretty hopeful that it just will carry on and send you the the, the current uh, text. Do what what you can. Yeah, uh, we can. Yeah. Okay. Like if you need to do certain things within G code, I think the workflow is you can modify the G code file beforehand. Would that work for you? You think? Because and no, then... no, this has nothing to do with the workflow. This is just. Um, of looking for 3D printers in the, okay, okay. Uh, that that are attached to the Pi. Okay, okay. Pi. So um, and and well, I, I thought maybe this wouldn't disrupt anything, but I'm actually not sure because when it's printing and I'm sending a code, hey, send me your name. Maybe this would disrupt or 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 uh, or just ask after it's done or something like that and then would, it would take an hour until the script ends that would be pretty bad maybe 10 hours if it's a big project yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. no we'll have to that would be a pretty we'll have to test that as we go along and the only other thing I can say for yeah. Oliver is uh, if Oliver you want to start testing some some stuff with Christian as well please feel free to coordinate between yourselves as well because uh, you guys are probably yeah, so, within uh, we, one or two hours of each other. Yeah. I don't know that actually, but maybe yeah, maybe we can look into that. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, but my task is to get. Pretty, pretty yeah, I gotta I gotta get the, um, the Raspberry Pi here as soon as possible and get that on Amazon and, and do that. Okay, excellent. So let we can move on then. Yeah, I, I think I'm done here. Sorry for that. That took so long. It's Thank you for monopolizing. Yeah, no, uh, that's that's good. That's really good progress, and and uh, that's a powerful function that we can get, and, and then start spreading the open source print cluster to the world. That's really good. Yep. Um, to so th to conclude the meeting here, then we got to talk about work work allocation. So there's um, let's see who else is is left here um, definitely work to be done so Dixon Roberto and IO let's see so uh, coordinating so let's cut the print cluster Lyman film and extruder so yeah we wanted to get some progress going just like Roberto did for the big box enclosure continue on on all the parts um, let's see so IO did you yeah let's see um, do you all have um, for you guys who are here do you have enough to go on to continue the work let's see Cassie tension mechanism can you guys prioritize what Roberto did in terms of um, 
so get the get the two-dimensional diagram with all the parts and then start filling the the labels around it just like we have in this document here on slide three and four we have examples but let's let's draw this up let's see three through five here um, this one being the most complete here fully complete uh, we need to start doing that for the other ones so next task would be just to start populating I think this document would be good to work in right in this document here and uh, you don't have to s set up a new document but basically take slide six and put in the next these are all labeled here already so please continue working in there um, Roberto's process is a good guide that's right for everybody else um, so Dixon uh, you can continue along that IO's got it Roberto do you wanna pipe into I mean if you don't have anything to do the only thing I can say so you got the STL files to to update but Feel free to take on the next, you know, the very next one. Steal it from somebody else who hasn't done it. Um, let's see. Yeah, go on to page. Let's go to page. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess... Extruder barrel, that's a Dixon, Israel thermal components. Israel started to do some work on the thermal components there. That's that started in in progress. And then spool mechanism, Cassie. Yeah, Will, I, let's see, has Will done anything? On this. Yeah. Yeah, so there's some there's some work here. But if we could do the um, follow Roberto's process to the other ones, that would be that would be good. Uh, Roberto, if you want to jump into any of the other ones, that's that's all I can say. But we got to get all these parts in so and drawn up so we can um, pretty much do the actual build. And I can actually start printing the parts pretty soon, as far as like next week or so. Um, so does anyone with that have yeah yeah Roberto I mean please just take you know take the next one like whichever one's not started just just do it like we we all want to coordinate so whoever's watching this Abe Roberto Will Cassie Io Israel Dixon look into this working document as the place to coordinate where all the work is so we know that um, now here Abe has started this doc but all the other ones, please start them right away here. Extruder barrel, auger flange, thermal components, spool electronics, tension mechanism, spool mechanism. So, um, yeah, so so please just work right in there and, and just take on the next next one that's not been done. And let's get this, get this done as soon as we can so we can build it. Just to review on, um, um, just in a working working document critical path for the meeting um, the way we're going at this so here's the filament maker oh I didn't put too many of the steps here let's see oh wait it's this would be in a real link to the actual document there um, yeah the filament maker we've been studying right now we're at the CAD phase the green line <clears throat> is where we are currently as soon as we have all the CAD we're kinda of moving through the CAD we need the full model and part sourcing <clears throat> and build but at the same time here uh, we can actually start some steps uh, we can literally start well I guess on the 10th we can start printing because I don't have available printer since I'm printing other things but we can start 3d printing so I'm gonna put that in here if it would let me 3d printing of parts right there yeah so please continue on that uh, I would say Roberto that I think the best one to take take on is 
which one which one has the least least progress I would say jump in just pick one and just d dive right in and and if um, if we use this document then everyone knows that we can work on this document but the idea is like there's more than one person can be working on on each one of them so so just um, maybe um, Roberto maybe take on the work with Cassie take on the tension mechanism and rollers I know she's got a lot of the parts maybe do the detailed diagram like you have and, and continue working with there so um, I would say perhaps join Cassie's effort here on on the roller the tension mechanism rollers so whichever okay so thank you very much then I think that kinda wraps up the meeting for the week um, I think all together just great progress on all fronts we're definitely moving along and uh, we'll see you next week then and please use the OSC the 3d printer uh, open source ecology network page continue there I haven't really looked at what the updates there are but I I always post the meeting up on the on the main development group which is the network that open source ecology org so you can also keep posting there yeah we had a little down downtime on the wiki but we're past that it was a service outing and we couldn't get it back online okay well thank you very much for everybody um, uh, we'll talk again next week so the next meeting would be regular time which is Tuesday 1 p.m. Central USA time so thank you very much and take care till then